Now, what happens if you get bitten by an effective Aegis-Objecti mosquito is maybe not. A uh, mosquito bites you, you don't even know it. Maybe you don't even have any symptoms. You never know that it bit you. Although, maybe, sometimes you might feel flu-like symptoms. Maybe you're sick for a few days. You wonder, why is this happening to me? Maybe it's a case of the flu. But you don't think anything of it because you recover. And again, you may never know that this mosquito bit you and caused you to be somewhat ill. But some cases, what happens is after you get better from the mild symptoms, then you get sick again. You don't get better all the way. And what happens when you get sick again, ultimately, is the virus, which is what this is, attacks your kidneys and attack your liver, and then you begin to bleed internally. And once that happens, the famous vomito, uh, which in Spanish-speaking countries is often what they call yellow fever. And that is uh, black vomit. It's coagulated blood that you know begin growing up. And once that happens, you now know this is yellow fever. And when that happens, your chances of survival are a little bit worse than 50-50. Once that happens. To this day, there's no cure for yellow fever. If that happens to you, you hope for the best. You begin the black vomit. And then after a little while, after that, uh, you begin, and this is very terrible for those who have to watch it, uh, as well as you, you begin bleeding through the eyes, bleeding through the nose, bleeding through the ears. Uh, you suffer terrible bodily pains. And then towards the end, you become very cold to the touch. Uh, your temperature drops. And if you're lucky, you die in the midst of delirium. That's yellow fever, dreadful in the extreme. Uh, again, once those toxic symptoms begin, probably chances are you're not going to get better. Uh, some do, uh, but chances are you won't. So if you begin from the, the moment of the bite uh, to the end of the toxic stage, uh, toxic stage uh, the chances of death in yellow fever are a little bit worse than 20%, uh, between 20 and 50%, but much, much worse when you get to the toxic stage. We don't have to worry that much about it now because we have a vaccine. And we've had a vaccine for about 80 years. Yeah, we have a... So how long it takes from bite to... Death. Oh, uh, bite, bite to uh, the, the toxic stage. Toxic stage would be a little over a week. And then uh, after that, it, it sometimes takes almost immediately to die for some people after that. Uh, some people linger for several days to a week after that. It uh, just depends. Yes? Question. Is it major something like squeeze, which is red? Why is it called yellow? It's called, called yellow fever because one of the symptoms, kind of the nicer ones, but I don't know these ones, but it's your skin yellows, so it looks like jaundice. So that's why it's called yellow fever. But you might have also heard the expression yellow jack, uh, that's a synonym for yellow fever. It's called yellow jack because if you're on a ship and there's yellow fever on the ship, you'd have to raise a yellow flag, uh, the yellow jack. So it's often called uh, yellow jack as well. Uh, but those are the uh, primary symptoms. And for many years, many hundreds of years, nobody had any idea that the Egyptus Egypti, what Egyptus Egypti was causing this. What they thought was based upon the fomite theory. And I thought this might be a fun time for a vocabulary quiz. Does anybody know what fomite means? Go ahead. So it's basically if you're touching stuff? It's basically you're touching stuff, that's right. Touching stuff infected by somebody with the virus, with the disease. So it could be soiled bedding, could be soiled night clothes, a lot of people thought that probably is what causes yellow fever. Somebody was wrapped up in that, they died, somebody else comes in contact with it, and then they die as well. But associated with that was the theory common to other diseases along the, the way people were thinking back then, hundreds of years ago, was that trash and bad hygiene, garbage in the streets, bad air, probably played a role in yellow fever as well. We know that's not true, but that's what they assumed. And the consequence was they had nothing in particular in mind that was ever gonna be effective about how to prevent this. The disease would strike, it'd be harrowing, it'd be horrible, many would die, and then you hope for the best for the next season. So yellow fever, uh, our topic today, uh, has a lot of different organizing themes, but as you see in a little while, uh, the organizing theme that I'm gonna choose is the role that yellow fever plays in the growth of the United States as a world power. Because yellow fever, uh, like almost every other disease uh, that we've talked about or will talk about, maybe even if we continue this same thing next year, uh, is not native to the New World, it's native elsewhere. Yellow fever is native to Africa. We know that its original population were probably uh, monkeys, and that's why there'll never be eradication of yellow fever. It's with us forever, because the reservoir of yellow fever among the monkey population is so very extensive, so it'll, it'll never be completely eradicated. 
But that's where it formed, eventually spread to humans, and it was taken to the New World, probably in the form of Aedes aegypti mosquito larvae carried by cisterns and slave ships. And they eventually matured, they hatched, and so yellow fever came to the New World that way. The very first yellow fever outbreak in the New World was around the Yucatan Peninsula in the mid-17th century, and it eventually, rather quickly, spread to what became the United States. There have been a total of 95 yellow fever epidemics in the United States since the 17th century. One of the very first ones was in Boston in 1693. And there were seven separate yellow fever epidemics in Boston, as a matter of fact, but one of only 95 uh, epidemics that we know of, but there could have been more. The very last yellow fever epidemic in the United States was 1905 because by then we know what caused it and we knew more or less what to do. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, here's an example of uh, you know, the horror of yellow fever. Here's somebody who's just died, uh, the discolored skin, the grief of the family. Uh, people here who are uh, lost in grief, not knowing what to do, are probably thinking about these bedclothes and what, what's gonna be the next step for them. And in, in terms of the worst places to be uh, in, for yellow fever, Everybody always talked about how you wouldn't want to be in New Orleans, which uh, would be the topic of the next slide. Uh, maybe if somebody wants to, oh, there you go. Uh, and take, take over New Orleans. Oh There's New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans uh, was afflicted by yellow fever repeatedly in its history. It was known as Necropolis, the city of the dead, because yellow fever was such a problem there. It is easy to see why yellow fever would be a problem in New Orleans. This is a low-lying place. A lot of it is a foot above sea level. Naturally, the, the rains are gonna fall. It's going to collect. There's garbage in the streets anyway in the 19th century, which is for a lot of people back then, the source of yellow fever anyway. No wonder this was a place where people would be terrified of yellow fever. 80% of the streets of New Orleans were unpaved through most, most of the 19th century. But the real problem, although they couldn't identify it that way because they didn't know about the mosquitoes, was that if you wanted to drink the water that would be piped in your house in New Orleans through much of the 19th century, you were always risking your life because the water came from the Mississippi and upstream from the water supply were the slaughterhouses. So animal waste and offals and intestines and all the blood, nasty things you can mention, they're going into the Mississippi and that's what you drink. And nobody in their right mind would want to do that. And so people would keep water in rain barrels and cisterns and that's where they get their drinking water uh, to the great delight of Venus Egypti. So naturally, uh, this was a place where yellow fever was quite common, not knowing because they didn't know that mosquitoes was a problem. So every few years, they would a major yellow fever epidemic in New Orleans. And we think between the 18th century and the beginning of the Civil War, maybe 150,000 people died in New Orleans of yellow fever. It was a fact of life. And it was such a fact of life that the historian Catherine Oliverius at Stanford has shown through her research that there was a major social system all based on yellow fever in New Orleans. So that if you applied for certain jobs in New Orleans, they would ask, are you acclimated? as the one thing everybody knew about yellow fever, besides the fact that it was awful, was that if you got it once, you never get it again. Unlike malaria, you keep getting that. But uh, yellow fever, you got it once, you never got it again. And if you got yellow fever once, you'd be acclimated. So you'd have to put down in a job application, I'm acclimated, then you might get the job. There are landlords who wouldn't rent to you unless you were acclimated. There were families that wouldn't let you bury their daughters unless you were acclimated. You had to show somehow you were acclimated. And if you weren't, you were at a real disadvantage in New Orleans. And one of the people who were always at a disadvantage were immigrants. That they come to New Orleans from places all around the world. How could they show that they have yellow fever? Of course, they have no documentation, no way of proving that. So some of the immigrants and others who moved to New Orleans, what they would do is they would purposely try to contract yellow fever. They uh, go places where there was yellow fever. Uh, they did do what they could based upon their knowledge to come down with the disease, hoping they'd get better. Because if they got better, that means they might get hired, they might get a better social position. And that was the New Orleans equivalent of all those chicken pox parties that people used to have. So that you get chicken pox, uh, eventually just get it over with. They would actually do that kind of thing in New Orleans. And in regard to slaves, the price of slaves would go, go down uh, unless they were acclimated, unless somehow you could show they, they had yellow fever. And this gives rise to a persistent myth that many plantation owners would cultivate and talk about in the 19th century, 
And the myth was that if you were African, you would not get yellow fever. Just totally contrary to their desire for acclimated slaves. Uh, so the price would be higher for them if they were acclimated. But the, but the racist idea was anybody who'd be working in the rice plantations, the sugar plantations, they might get yellow fever and we can't have whites working there uh, because they might get yellow fever, but black people, Africans don't get yellow fever and that's what we need to have them working there. And that was never true. Uh, black bodies as well as white bodies are prone to yellow fever. Black people die of yellow fever just as whites do. What was true is that if you were from Central Africa or West Africa where yellow fever is endemic, you might have gotten it when you were a child. And if you survived it as a child, then you would have immunity. And if you got dengue fever as a child, you might have limited immunity to yellow fever after that. So it's the same mosquito. So that was true. There was acquired immunity, but there was never any such thing as natural immunity. That was always a racist trope that uh, people in the South like to exchange with each other to justify slavery. It was terrifying, though. Now, remember that slide? You may now turn from New Orleans up the river to the worst of all yellow fever epidemics in American history, which happened in 1878 in the Mississippi River Valley, and especially happened in Memphis. In July of, 19, of, of 1878, the people of Memphis began to hear word from New Orleans that people there were sickening. This yellow fever in New Orleans. They began to hear the rumor. They began to wonder, should we bar people from New Orleans from coming here if they acted too late? By August, the first yellow fever case had been diagnosed in Memphis. And this is what happened. The only effective way to prevent yellow fever, if you didn't have it already, was to leave. And in Memphis, there were uh, 37,000 people, 20,000 left when they heard that yellow fever was in the city. And I mean they left. They left dinner settings on the table. They left their doors unlocked. They got out. Here were people leaving. Many of them had no place to go. They just hoped for the best. And communities around Memphis wanted nothing to do with these refugees from Memphis. There were uh, tales of sidecar or, or, or siding quarantine. You might have heard about that, where people would stand by the railroad sidings with shotguns to make sure nobody got off if the train was coming from Memphis. This was an emergency precisely because it was such a terrifying disease. Uh, there were only about uh, 19, 17,000 people or so left in the city. Uh, all but 2,000 of them got yellow fever. Almost everybody in Memphis got yellow fever during this epidemic, and 5,000 of them died of the disease. 200 a day in Memphis were dying of yellow fever at the height of this in August and September of 1878. But among those who stayed in yellow fever were heroes. And the thing about yellow fever is it was so horrifying a disease that if you stayed and faced it and did what you could for the sick, you were a hero. Like bubonic plague, if you stayed during the Black Death and you cared for the sick, that made you a hero, I think, in anybody's book. And there were heroes in Memphis. One of those who stayed in the city so that he could care for the sick was a man who could have easily afforded to leave. Uh, his name was Dr. William Armstrong, and he went from house to house to house of yellow fever victims doing what he could until he was afflicted by the terrible virus. He fell ill. He was on his deathbed. His last act on his deathbed, his last conscious act, was trying to get up to go to another house to do what he could for those who had the disease. He perished in that bed. And he is one of the people of Memphis who are remembered as the uh, yellow fever martyrs uh, of 1878, the martyrs of Memphis. Not just him, but also the nuns of the city. There was a convent there. You've seen the movie uh, Priscilla, well, Priscilla Presley. Uh, I think that's the same convent. Uh, I'm not sure. I think so. Thanks for a good story. But those nuns, <laughs> those nuns went from door to door to door, and wherever they find found children whose parents had died, kids alone in the house, who's going to take care of them? The nuns would take them to the orphanage and care for them until other loved ones could be found uh, where they could go live after the epidemic. Now we go to the next slide. But the biggest hero of all was Annie Cook. And Annie Cook was a prostitute. She came to Memphis right after the Civil War when Memphis was a boom town. A lot of people wanted to move to Memphis. She established a brothel there. And then in 1878, she turned the brothel into a hospital. And anybody who had nowhere else to go could go to Annie Cook's brothel, now a hospital. And she kept caring for people. She hired nurses to do what they could. And eventually she died of yellow fever as well. 
but not before becoming known, as you may be able to make out here on the gravestone, as the Mary Magdalene of Memphis. Very fond remembered in the city. Ultimately, after 5,000 were dead in October, the disease ran its course. And by then, the legislature of Tennessee actually debated destroying Memphis as too much of a health hazard to allow it to continue as a city. Thankfully, they didn't do that. But it gives you some idea about how fearsome this was. But that's the thing about yellow fever. So terrifying that if you stood and faced it, uh, you were made of sterner stuff than, than certainly me. Now we go to the next slide. The most famous of all yellow fever epidemics, although not the most destructive, was the one that happened in Philadelphia uh, in 1793. Uh, in Philadelphia in 1793, here's a scene of people being uh, taken into a carriage, maybe to go to a hospital, uh, was a place where there emerged a real hero. And the next slide will show you the hero. Uh, that is Stephen Gerard. Uh, as you can see here, he was missing the right eye. Uh, that's one thing about him. Other thing about him is he made a fortune in opium trading with the Chinese. Uh, so he was a little, little bit unsavory as a character until 1793. In August of 1793, the first yellow fever case arose in Philadelphia. And we think probably it arose from somebody who had been fleeing the Great Slave Revolt in San Dominique, now Haiti, that was going on at the same time, led, as we'll see in a little while, by, by Toussaint Lovisher. But however it got here, people began to get sick. 1793. Anybody who could have left the city. It's only the, the sensible thing to do. George Washington left the United States government, left Philadelphia in order to survive, leaving less than half of the people of Philadelphia still in the city. They tried everything to make this terrible virus go away. They set up explosions in the street, uh, wherever the major intersections were, Market and Chestnut, they began setting up bonfires, explosions. They would fire uh, rifles in the air. They would smoke tobacco, hoping maybe something about that would keep the disease away. Nothing worked. The only thing to do was leave, but many couldn't. One person who could have left was him. He was the richest person in Philadelphia. He had a big mansion in New Jersey. Could have left easily, but he stayed. He stayed with another hero, the mayor of Philadelphia, Mayor Clarkson. And together they put together a relief committee. They formed a brand new hospital on 18th Street, often called Bushy Hill. They hired people to act as nurses. And to their everlasting credit, they wouldn't let Dr. Benjamin Rush anywhere near their patients at the hospital. Dr. Rush thought that yellow fever might be caused by coffee grounds brought in from Haiti uh, on the four wharves of the Delaware River. And his solution to yellow fever was to dose patients with copious amounts of mercury no. and believe them, which was not the way to go. <laughs> Stephen Gerard was not a doctor, but he knew that wasn't going to work. So he and Mary Clarkson had another idea. They've got yellow fever. Let's bring them to this hospital. We'll put them in as many beds as we can find, and we'll feed them. We'll give them nourishing soups, and maybe we can strengthen them, and maybe against all odds, they'll get better. If people did get better at the hospital, surely would have died otherwise. To his everlasting credit, he didn't just put up the money for the hospital. He would go in the carriages. He'd pick up yellow fever victims, bring them to the hospital. He would serve them the soup. People would form with the coagulated blood all over him, but he still served them the soup. This was a hero, and he stayed there throughout the epidemic. He didn't seem to have slept for five weeks during the great yellow fever epidemic of 1793. And at the end of it, he never got sick. Uh, and he became a hero. He was always looked up to because he was so rich, but now he was a hero because of what he did for the people of Philadelphia. According to some measures, Stephen Gerard was the fourth richest person in US history, if you allow for inflation. Still number one is guess who? J.P. Morgan. I uh, had a lot in common with, with Stephen Gerard, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. John D. Rockefeller, still number one, still number one uh, in, in U.S. history. I think Bill Gates is number three, uh, and Stephen Gerard is number four. You mentioned uh, J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan saved the country in 1895 by bailing out a government on the precipice of bankruptcy by buying a bunch of U.S. bonds when they were considered very good investments at the time. Stephen Gerard did the same thing in the War of 1812. We would have gone totally bankrupt. He bought, uh, I think, $8 million in U.S. bonds, risky bonds, saved the government uh, so that we could live and flourish another day. He's very well remembered for that reason. Uh, but he's also a man who gave rise to a case I love to teach in my classes. Uh, 
about the college he founded, Girard College. Girard College was to educate young males without families so that they get up careers and have a chance in life, orphan kids. Uh, but according to his will, Girard College was only open to white males. And that was true for over 100 years in Philadelphia, the famous Girard College. And then in the 1960s, that will was challenged under the Equal Protection Clause. And the courts had a real decision here. What prejudice value do we enforce? Will it be the prejudice value of always giving rise to the will of the testator in cases of wills, which is a big, major prejudice value in the law, or the prejudice value of equal protection and anti-discrimination? They had to wrestle with that one. The courts of Pennsylvania decided, we like the wills. We're going to enforce the will. Uh, no black people at Gerard College, uh, but the federal courts uh, decided, no, we got to enforce the Constitution. And so Gerard College today is integrated and is still uh, one of the great institutions of its sort in the country, all based upon the will of the hero of Philadelphia, Stephen Gerard. One night racist, also a hero, uh, at least in his own way. Now we go to the next slide. Now we turn to uh, San Dominique. Uh, so that is the island of Hispaniola. And uh, that is now it was divided into the Spaniards of this part and the French of this part for a, a well over 100 years. Uh, we call it Haiti, they call it San Dominique. And the story of American empire begins there. Uh, on the left hand side of the island of Hispaniola, recall that New Orleans was founded by the French in 1718. Uh, and it was ruled by the French up until 1763. And then the vast territory between the Mississippi in the Rockies passed to the, to, uh, the Spaniards. And the Spaniards had it uh, up until 1800 when they sold it to Napoleon uh, via the Treaty of San Ildefonso. And now Napoleon and the French once more had that vast territory between the Rockies and the Mississippi called Louisiana. Napoleon had plans for that territory. He was fascinated by America. What he wanted to do was create a vast, powerful French empire in the new world that could hold its own against the Spanish to the west and the American Republic to the east. But to do that, he needed to send an army to New Orleans in Louisiana. He was embroiled with this terrible war with the Austrians and the Russians and the British, but all of that was finally settled in 1801, the Treaty of Amiens. And when that happened, he could give rise at long last to the great dream of his life, what he called the Western design to send a French army to the New World and form a Napoleonic empire here in our backyard. Now we go to the next slide. He could turn his attention to New Orleans, but on the way, he decided to stop in Haiti. Uh, San Dominique, because San Dominique had all but freed itself through the efforts of Toussaint Louverture and the greatest of all slave rebellions, which had begun a uh, little over 10 years before. So Napoleon's idea, was to send an army to New Orleans, they stop in Haiti, they take over Haiti again, get all the coffee and the sugar and the riches there, and then proceed to New Orleans and make a French empire. And the man in command was this guy, uh, that's Napoleon's brother-in-law. Uh, his name, I want to get it just right, was uh, Charles Victor Emmanuel Leclerc, 30 years old. He will command the army, uh, well over 25,000 men will go to San Dominique. Uh, and the reason he's Napoleon's brother-in-law is because he married Pauline. That's Napoleon's favorite sister. Napoleon had bad taste with sisters. Uh, <laughs> he was not interested in anything. Uh, you know, like literature, knew very little about art, although she collected it. Uh, bad conversation. Uh, good looking. Uh, clerk. Uh, and because of that, the clerk got the command. So on they go. They got to stop in San Dominic. The 25,000 men in the first forest will be followed by others. Eventually, there would be something like 50,000 being sent to San Dominique. Uh, but the original force included 5,000 Poles of the famous Polish Legion that fought with Napoleon because they trusted his promise to create an independent Poland should he finally win the wars uh, that were eventually, by the way, about to resume. Uh, although, for the time being, there was a truce which allowed these armies to be sent in the first place. To the new world. Now we go to the next slide. Uh, if you ever want to see Pauline, by the way, uh, you just have to go to Rome, go to the Villa Borghese, and this is Pauline. Uh, that's Venus Victrix by the great sculptor Canova, and uh, that's her in marble. That's Pauline. 
You probably have a better conversation with the statue. Uh, <laughs> if we continue with the story, uh, the day it finally came, it's the beginning of 1802, February 1802, and Toussaint Louverture looked out in the great bay of Samana near the city of Cap Francais, as they called it then, and he could see the French Armada spreading out in all directions. And he said to his associate, all France has come to Saint Dominique. What are we going to do? All France has come to Saint Dominique. They burned Cap Francais rather than allow it to fall into the hands of the French. The French landed. Leclerc led the army inland. All Asians know the story of what happened next. Battle after battle, including heroic resistance at a mountain top fortress called Crete Pierrot, where 2,000 French died assaulting that fortress as the Haitians taunted them by singing at the top of their lungs, Les Marciers, Les Marciers, you say you believe in freedom, you're trying to conquer us. How can you live with yourselves? That was March. In April, the rain started coming down. The second in command of the French army was a guy named Donatien Rochambeau, who was the son of the famous associate of Washington. Uh, he hated anybody with African ancestry. Napoleon was a terrible racist. Rochambeau was even worse. And what Rochambeau would do is if he captured people, one thing he would resort to is taking the captives, putting them in the hold of vessels off of the northern coast of Haiti, and he would lock them in the holds and he would begin burning sulfur, and he would create sulfur dioxide, I think, and he would get, he would put that into the hold and they would die by gassing. So one of the very first incidents of killing people by gassing in recorded history. That's how cruel this war was. By the end of April, it was raining harder. And very significantly, Eden's ship died, was flourishing. Nobody attached any significance to that, though. All they knew was that French soldiers we're beginning to die and die horribly. The black vomit, the bleeding from the eyes in the ears. Pauline was not struck. She came with Leclerc on the expedition. She had her own little island off the coast where she would entertain her lovers. She made a nice zoo for herself so she could look at the nice animals. But on the mainland part of Hispaniola in San Dominique, dozens were dying every day. Leclerc would send notices back to Napoleon. I have 600 men on the sick list. And then a few days later, he write, I have 1,200 men on the sick list. It wasn't getting any better. By June, it was a full-fledged epidemic. By July, 10,000 had died in the French army of yellow fever. These Europeans had never had anything close to immunity. None of them had ever been exposed to yellow fever before. No chance to build up anything from childhood. And so they died. The only thing to do now if you're not going to leave San Dominique, was to take what was left of the army up into the hillsides, where there would be a measure of safety. Not as many mosquitoes up there, but they didn't know about mosquitoes. All they knew was the tradition that the death is less the higher you go. And Leclerc wanted permission to take his army to the highlands, but he was under orders from Napoleon. Keep them in the lowlands. That's where the sugar was. That's where the sugar plantations were. Keep them in the lowlands. And so he kept the army down there, and they died. Half of the Poles, all the way from the area around Warsaw and Krakow, half of the Poles died of yellow fever thousands of miles away from home in San Dominique, fighting for a man who never intended to give them any kind of a homeland. As one account said, they fell down as they walked, blood rushing out of their nostrils, mouth and eyes, a horrible sight. Before the end, people would actually drop dead at Pauline's home. And she left special instructions, don't let me see the bodies, get them away before I have to look at the bodies. Eventually, General Leclerc himself, the Polish brother-in-law, died of yellow fever. And a week later, Pauline left. The thing that upset her the most, just like Scarlett O'Hara, which she had to wear black for a while, which she didn't like. <laughs> but we go back to France. At the worst of it, I, maybe there were 8,000 French soldiers left in Haiti barely hanging on to the major towns along the coast, but that was it. They should have been withdrawn, but Napoleon sent more men. They died too, most of them of yellow fever. Tens of thousands of Haitians died as well. This after all was an epidemic, not all of them, of course, by any means had immunity, but enough French died 
so that ultimately they had to give up this enterprise entirely. They got on the ships, what was left of them, and they went back to France. Now we go to the next slide. What was Napoleon to do now? So here are people died. Uh, this happens to be uh, uh, Porto Prince, uh, and ultimately uh, Porto Prince will keep the same name. Uh, Francais will be Cartagien, uh, which it is now. Now we go to the next slide. Oh, next one. Oh yeah. And here's what happened next. What was Napoleon going to do now? Uh, the entire adventure in Haiti had been a murderous, catastrophic flop. He had no army left to send anywhere. So he made the best of it, and he decided to sell New Orleans to the United States. But not just New Orleans, all of Louisiana. Everything that the French had done by the Treaty of San Ildefonso between the Mississippi and the Rockies, all of Louisiana now sold to the United States. And the main reason was the resistance of the Haitians and it is a chip dot. I had it not been for that, there might have been a Napoleon, Napoleonic Empire in the New World. And to me, the most likely consequence of that would have been within about a dozen years, all of that would have ended up after Napoleon's defeat in the hands of the British Empire at the Congress of Vienna, where we would have been surrounded by the British Empire, Canada and Louisiana, and I'll bet the British would have had every intention of hanging on to that. They could have hung on to that. There's nothing much we could have done about it back then, which meant no civil war, no vast riches of agriculture and mining, which is what you see in that area. No United States but the world power. Slavery would have lasted perhaps longer than it did. Who knows? Nobody can say for sure. But one thing is certain that the growth of the United States as a world power would have been unthinkable without the riches of that territory, which would never have been ours had it not been for yellow fever and the end of Napoleon's army in Haiti. Uh, for which we owe a debt of gratitude to the people of Haiti who existed, and also to Edith Spichetta. <laughs> now, neither Napoleon, nor Leclerc, nor anyone else, of course, knew anything about that mosquito. Uh, but they certainly knew by the end of this epidemic how awful it was, uh, as anybody in the New World knew in, in Africa. Now, and one person who really knew how bad yellow fever was was the general much better than General Leclerc. And we go to the next slide. Uh, and that was General Winfield Scott. So the year is now 1847, the second year of the war against Mexico. General Winfield Scott, very reluctantly, was sent by President Polk to try to march from the Gulf of Mexico to capture Mexico City, end the war, and secure a, a viable good peace treaty with Mexico. Easier said than done. Winfield Scott's idea, but the only thing he could have done, if those were his instructions, were to land here in Veracruz. Veracruz was the origin of yellow fever in the New World. Uh, the first yellow fever cases, Yucatan Peninsula, were around the area of Veracruz. And it was known in Mexico as the deadliest place to be in terms of yellow fever. And that's where Winfield Scott had to go. And he had to go there in March, very near the beginning of yellow fever season. And he was petrified of this because he knew if the army, the US Army, stayed in Veracruz, chances are they melt away Hardly anybody had immunity from the army. Chances are they melted away just as Lecaric's army had melted away in 1802 and 1803. So he had a decision to make. We go to the next slide. He landed in Veracruz in March. There's Veracruz. He had to get inland right away. So this is the uh, Terra Caliente. They call it that because that's where the disease is. Uh, yellow fever, Terra Caliente. So he's got to land there. He's got to get down the natural road, pretty much Cortez's route to Mexico City. And he's got to get there quickly because if he stays there at maybe mid-April, uh, his his whole army could be gone. Now the other person who knew that was General Santana. Uh, so it's, this is Santana's idea. If you didn't know about yellow fever, uh, what you'd probably do once Winfield Scott had landed there is take your army and carry Winfield Scott all the way. Attack here, attack here, attack here, attack here. Make it difficult for him. Make him leave people to guard supply lines pick off elements of his army as best you can by small skirmishes, small battles. So eventually when he gets to Mexico City, there'll be many of them left. And that would have been a good strategy. But Santa Ana knew about yellow fever too. And he knew the easiest way to defeat the Americans, Winfield Scott, was to keep them in the Tierra Caliente. So what he decided to do was make a stand with his entire army here at the edge of the Tierra Caliente. Carol Gordo, we go to the next slide. That strategy 
to try to hold Winfield Scott and Carol Gordo, wouldn't that be disastrous for the Mexicans? Because as Winfield Scott approached, knowing he had no choice, he had to get through somehow. He commissioned his young engineers to find a way around superior Mexican forces right in his path on the National Road. And the man who commanded those engineers was Captain Robert E. Lee. <laughs> and Robert E. Lee found this route right around like this, there. And that meant they could get around Santa Ana. He definitely tried to hold them off. He couldn't. His army was defeated at that battle, Carro Gordo, and they had to retreat all the way to Mexico City. So it was with a large army that Winfield Scott approached Mexico City, fought the battles around us successfully, captured the capital, and won the war against Mexico. Had Santana not tried to stop them there because of yellow fever, maybe Winfield Scott would have been much attenuated by the time they got to Mexico City, unable to capture one of the great capital cities of the world. But the way it was, he had plenty of men, he won the battles there, won the war, and we go to the next slide. The consequence, of course, was the addition of that to the American domain. Uh, Louisiana, we owe in part the Edis of Chuck died, but also the vast region between the Rockies and the Pacific, which entered the United States with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 after the Mexican War. And still, nobody knows it's mosquitoes spreading this. <laughs> so how are they gonna figure that out? Shortly after the Mexican War, if we go to the next slide, uh, this guy here, uh, yet another virulent racist in our story, uh, that's Josiah Knott of uh, Alabama. Uh, he was living in New Orleans in the middle of the 19th century. In 1853, New Orleans in one of its periodic yellow fever epidemics. He lost four children to yellow fever in New Orleans. And he was a doctor. He began to do some research. He decided that this fomite theory, bedding, night clothes, it, it can't be true because we clean all that stuff, nothing works, yellow fever still spreads. He thought it was probably mosquitoes. And he printed a paper arguing that maybe mosquitoes were spreading yellow fever. Nobody listened to him. And people still died. The 1870 epidemic, 25 years later, still nobody's thinking it's yep, mosquitoes. Now we go to the next slide. Until 1881. <coughs> and that's one of the great heroes of our story. Uh, that is our Carlos Finley. And in 1881, Cuban doctor, having been educated in the United States, turned his attention to this question, what caused the yellow fever? He also thought it was probably mosquitoes. And to his everlasting credit, I don't know how he did it, but he found out that the species of Edis mosquitoes, there's 950 members of the species Edis, he actually isolated the one that does it, Edis aegypti. He was the first one who did it. And he began conducting experiments. He was sure this was it. He was sure it was Edis aegypti causing yellow fever. And he did experiments on people where he'd have mosquitoes, Edis aegypti, bite yellow fever victims, and then bite healthy people. <coughs> but they didn't get sick. And he kept rubbing his chin. Why aren't they getting sick? He, he knew this had to be it. Well, the reason they weren't getting uh, sick was because he didn't take account of the long incubation period of the yellow fever virus in the saliv saliva glands of Edis aegypti. Uh, so he didn't give enough time for the mosquitoes after the bite to infect somebody else. Well, he didn't know that. All he had was a theory. But it was just him. They thought he was crazy. They called him uh, Dr. Mosquito. <laughs> or the Mosquito Man. You're an idiot. How should you think it was mosquitoes? So the French didn't know it was mosquitoes when they decided they were going to build a canal across Panama in the 1880s. And that's the story uh, a lot of you know about if you've read McCullough's book. They're going to dig this big ditch across Panama. It, it worked in Suez. Why not Panama? Uh, so the less is going to build this big ditch. Uh, they got to Panama to build the ditch. A lot of you know what happened next. 20,000 people, uh, many of them French, uh, died of yellow fever and malaria. But yellow fever was the big killer. And the reasons there were so many yellow fever deaths was that the French, wherever they went, would have these nice gardens. If we go to the next slide. Oh, oh yeah, we'll, we'll stay there for a while. Uh, uh, and they, they want the ants to lay off the flowers so they have a nice cistern in the water, bowls of water, so the ants go in the water, they don't bother the flowers. Uh, and even the I didn't mind keeping company with ants, that's fine with them. And also, you, know, you might remember that in the sick wards, 
They don't want the patients getting crawled out by hand, so they have these bowls of water on the bed stands. Also, and then out the windows open, nobody's having screens on the windows. So in comes the Aedes aegypti, dusk and dawn, hatches their eggs in the water, bites anybody that they could get a reach with during the three week lifespan. And the result was a catastrophe in Panama. They never got anywhere near building the canal. And they're not crediting any of them, the idea of mosquitoes. Now we're into the 1890s. And still, hardly anybody credits Dr. Finley's idea that it's mosquitoes bringing the disease. And as long as that was true, we would have yellow fever with us, people would die of it. There had to be some occasion that would finally persuade people that it was mosquitoes that was the vector and not this old, old idea of bedclothes. I forgot to mention that fomite theory is bedclothes and garbage and filth and infected uh, sheets and things like that that spread yellow fever. Has anybody ever heard the name uh, Blackburn? Luke Blackburn. Early example of a war criminal, uh, Luke Blackburn, he thought it was a good idea to get a bunch of yellow fever victims, bedclothes, and sheets. And during the Civil War, because he was a Southerner, he sent them to President Lincoln. So here's a nice present for you. He didn't tell Lincoln that they were infected by yellow fever. Uh, and he was hoping that Lincoln would actually use the bed sheets, uh, which luckily he didn't. But they actually caught him for doing that eventually, but they caught him in Canada. And when the Canadian authorities prosecuted him, somebody found out we well, didn't break any law in Canada, uh, so they let him go. So I'm not sure what happened to him after that. But that's how strong the fomite theory was. Until US forces in 1898 landed in Cuba, and here they are, there's a Roosevelt there on horseback, trudging up San Juan Hill. They landed in Cuba in June of 1898, and what was on everybody's mind was yellow fever. In malaria, but also yellow fever, we gotta win, we gotta win quick. Because if we don't, yellow fever is going to strike. Who knows what happens then? Uh, but within a little over a week, they were laying siege to Santiago, forces the surrender to surrender of Santiago in July of 1898. And very luckily for us, although we did have yellow fever deaths, it wasn't a big epidemic year in 1898. And it wouldn't be a big one in 1899 either. Uh, about 10 times the number of Americans died of disease in Cuba than died in battle. But it wasn't as bad as it would have been. But we didn't know that we were going to be occupying Cuba for a while uh, under the terms of the treaty that ended the war. And so it was only a matter of time. How could American forces occupy Cuba and be free of yellow fever? There had to be a way to treat this, but to treat it, we had to know what was going on with the disease. So very famously, a uh, U.S. Army in 1898 uh, sent, we go to the next slide, uh, Dr. Walter Reed down to Cuba, and they established the U.S. Yellow Fever Commission to try to get to the bottom of what was causing yellow fever. And their original idea is fomites is filled. But to Dr. Reed's everlasting credit, he figured out pretty early that there's no evidence that it's fomites. Everybody thinks that, but there's no real evidence for it. And because this was Cuba, he came into contact with Dr. Finley's theory, Carlos Finley, and he also came into contact with Dr. Finley's collection of uh, infected yellow fever, Aedes aegypti larvae, and eggs. So you'd have plenty of yellow fever mosquitoes if you wanted to conduct experiments to see if Dr. Finley was actually correct. Are these mosquitoes spreading the disease? The most amazing part of the story is he knew he needed human volunteers. Uh, we gotta find out. Uh, we gotta find people with yellow fever, uh, get mosquitoes to bite them, we gotta have the mosquitoes after the right incubation period which is where he felt Finley had gone wrong, uh, to find healthy people, and that we will know. If they get yellow fever, it's probably mosquitoes. And these were the original volunteers, the members of the Yellow Fever Commission. They were doctors. But they risked their lives, they volunteered, to see if Dr. Finley had been right. The very first experiments, I think, were in 1900. They're in Havana. And Dr. Carroll uh, allowed himself to be bitten by a mosquito that, according to the theory at least, was affected by the virus, yellow fever. Also, an extremely brave member of the U.S. Army named William Dean allowed himself to be infected. Uh, I think they were infected by the same mosquito, as a matter of fact. And Dr. Walter Reed, who was up in Washington while this was going on, was terrified. Now, these were his friends. What if they die? And then, Dr. Carroll did get yellow fever, as did William Dean. Now they know it's probably mosquitoes. 
And they lived. Dr. Carroll didn't die. And we have a letter that Walter Reed wrote uh, to, I think, his wife, maybe back to Dr. Carroll, that he wrote when he found out that Dr. Carroll didn't die. He actually said, hooray, in the letter. He actually said, I'm going to go get drunk. He was so happy that Dr. Carroll hadn't died. But Dr. Lazier did die. Uh, he allowed himself to be infected by yellow fever. He didn't knowingly. He died of the disease. And because of his sacrifice and courage, if you go to the National Cathedral in Washington, there's a stained glass window depicting Dr. Lazier. His family tried to pretend that it wasn't yellow fever that killed him for insurance purposes. <laughs> because it was almost like suicide. How are you going to recover on the policy with suicide? But we know, based upon his notebooks, that he did. He affected himself knowingly, like Dr. Carroll did. Uh, but he wasn't lucky enough. He was one of the ones who died and died very badly. So now Dr. Rock, Walter Reed and the others knew the problem is Edith's a gypta. That's probably what's doing it. But again, as the scientists among you know, that's a really small sample size. <laughs> but there's only uh, three people. So they've got to make a bigger survey. They gather to Cuba. They ask for volunteers among U.S. military personnel and also new immigrants to Cuba, especially from Spain. And they got 30 volunteers to be in this yellow survey test. And the way it worked was interesting. They wanted to disprove the fomite theory. So some of the mosquitoes were put in a specially built house that Dr. Reed set up. And in the house, they would sleep in yellow fever bedding. And they would put on the pajamas of patients who had died of yellow fever. And have to spend weeks in infected, filthy bedding. And they hated it. They hated every minute of it. But they lived. <laughs> and then there was another place. And those are people who just sleep there with, without any mosquitoes, without anything at all. That was what we would call the control group. But then there was the third group. And they were the ones infected by mosquitoes or blood from yellow fever victims. And one of the guys infected by mosquito bitten blood of a yellow fever victim was a guy who had actually pretty significant history, uh, so significant that I can't find his name. Uh, and uh, that man was once known. Um, and the reason he's important is. Uh, yeah, so. He actually did get yellow fever from infected blood. And by that time, they had this mesh that they were using to put in infected blood. And the mesh was, was small enough that no bacterium could get in. So we know that that person, who, of course, is known to everybody, <laughs> was the very, very first person we know to be infected by a virus. Because it had to be a virus. Viruses are smaller than bacteria. So it had to be a virus infected. The very first person we know absolutely was affected by a virus. Uh, was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the interesting thing about this test was that uh, General Leonard Wood, the great General Leonard Wood, Theodore Roosevelt's buddy, uh, who was governor of Cuba, insisted that every single person who signed up for this study, whether they're going to be the fomites or the control group or the mosquito group, they all had to sign a form, detailed information about what they're going to do, what the risks are, and that was the first major incident of informed consent in a medical study. Was Dr. Leonard, would you guys sign this form? You want, you want you to know what you're getting into. You're volunteers. We're not going to trick you. We're not going to hide anything. This is what you're doing. And they signed the form. And the idea was they're going to get paid $100, every one of them. But they get paid more if they get yellow fever. <laughs> and uh, one guy said, I'm not going to take any money. This is for science. This is for science. I'm doing good. I'm not going to take any money. That was a private Kissinger. But one guy, the opposite end of the scale, was a guy from New England named John Ballard, who just moved to Cuba. And he said, I'll probably yell fever anyway. Might as well do it this way. Uh, he took the money. Uh, but they had the experiment, informed consent, and ultimately, conclusively, under this experiment, the only people who got sick were the ones with infected blood. Uh, the mosquito category were the ones who got sick. And now we know what causes yellow fever is Edith the Gypti. By 1901, we knew that conclusively. It's Edith the Gypti who causes. Uh, yellow fever. And the name of that famous person who was infected by a virus was Albert Cummings. Albert Cummings. That's <laughs> uh, the man. So that's 1901. And now we, there are two things now that uh, we know. We know that you don't get yellow fever again if you have it once. And now we know it's caused by mosquitoes. Very valuable piece of information. And all this happened in 1901 with the mosquitoes 
just in time, of course, for the United States to acquire Panama and build our own canal. <laughs> now we go to the next slide. And uh, as we come to the end of our story, that's the last hero of our tale. A man a lot of you know about, that's uh, uh, Captain William Borges, as he, as, as he was for a lot of his career, uh, Captain Borges, who uh, loved the idea from an early age of joining the army. Really loved the idea of a military career, but he, I don't think he could get into West Point. So he wanted a way to get a commission that was easier than having to apply again to West Point. And the easiest way to get a commission was to become a doctor. That, that makes you an officer right away if you're a doctor. And so he became a doctor, joined the army, and was stationed in Brownsville, Texas in the 1880s when there was a yellow fever epidemic. And he began treating yellow fever victims, doing the best he could with a limited amount of resources that he had, of course. And one of the people in Brownsville who got yellow fever was a young woman named Marie, the sister-in-law of a commanding officer at the post where he was in Brownsville. And she was so sick from yellow fever that they had actually prepared the burial service for her and they had dug a grave for her. She was all ready to go. Uh, we got everything ready. Uh, and Dr. Gorgas uh, was treating her and he was delighted when she got better, uh, but then he got yellow fever and they convalesced together and they talked a lot. And of course, they ended up getting married. And now Dr. Gorgas was immune to yellow fever because he got yellow fever and survived. That made him the go-to guy for a while in the army when it came to yellow fever. And he was very impressed by Dr. Reed's evidence. Now he was convinced like everybody else with any sense that it was mosquitoes who caused the virus or spread the virus. So while he was in Cuba, he was familiar with the evidence and he was put in charge of the crucial work of trying to rid Havana of yellow fever, which he did very effectively by leading a corps of over 150 people to fumigate premises, uh, kill as many mosquitoes as they could, and especially educate people never to leave standing water around. And they go door to door, they go alley to alley, they clean up waste, but especially they would tell people, don't leave standing water around, that's good for mosquitoes, bad for you. And they didn't just order people around, they reasoned with them, they let them know, they had Spanish speakers who explained to them the vector of this disease and why this was necessary. And just like that, by the first decade of the 20th century, yellow fever was a thing of the past in Havana. A place that, like New Orleans, had long been struck by yellow fever epidemics, was now free of yellow fever again. That was crucial because a lot of yellow fever in the New World was spread by people who went to Havana, got infected there, and while they could still walk, would go somewhere else and infect people now elsewhere. And now that was gone. No more yellow fever in Havana. Dr. Gorgas had done it, and he had done so well that, of course, what they're now going to do is send him to the canal zone just in time for us to begin building the canal. Unbelievably, there were plenty of people in the U.S. Panama Canal Commission who still didn't think it was mosquitoes. They still didn't think so. It's got to be the fomite theory. It's got to be bed clothing. And at first, Corgan only had eight people working with him to get rid of mosquitoes with the whole canal zone. He's got eight people working with him. The result was predictable. When destruction began, people began to die. And it wasn't an epidemic yet, but enough died where nobody in their right mind would go to Panama to work at the canal. Malaria and yellow fever might kill you. The entire canal project was at a dead end by the uh, beginning of 1905. And it would have stayed a dead end had it not been for Theodore Roosevelt, who was smart enough to look at the evidence and give Dr. Borges ultimately all he needed, along with a brand new canal commission so he did it just some eight people. He had thousands of people working under him. Ultimately, they got to work and they got rid of all the cisterns and the standing water. They fumigated places. Everything they did in Havana, they did throughout the canal zone. And crucially, what Dr. Gorgas did was he made sure that more and more people in the canal zone who were living there had access to fresh water, healthy water, so they wouldn't have to keep rain barrels out to catch what water came down from the sky. And even as the chip died, began to fade away, and so the yellow fever in the canal zone. If we go to the next slide, would be the scene of the greatest engineering project of the 20th century, according to some people, at least. Uh, and that's chapter three of the rise to America as a world power that yellow fever and Edith's chip died has something to do with it. Uh, here's an example of a, a, a hospital in the canal zone getting to see flowers around. I mean, one of the French wanted the ants to be kept away by those poles. But whatever Gorgas saw a pole is going to tip it over. No poles. <laughs> the worst thing you can do. Screens on the door, no poles, and we get rid of each chip die and yellow fever. Bringing us finally to the last chapter in our story. There's only one thing left to do. Uh, we know how to prevent yellow fever now. 
And that is sort of an idea to chip guy as much as we can. We know that you get better, uh, you're never going to get it again. The only other thing we need to do is prevent it permanently without worrying about these measures that people like Morgan said to adopt. And that means we need a vaccine. And through a lot of experimentation in the middle of the 20th century, a South African doctor using a blood sample from a guy from Ghana whose name happened to be Asibi, which is why it's called the Asibi sample, uh, using that one sample of yellow fever infected blood, he was able to pass it through uh, many, many dozens of chicken embryos until he found a way, he found a strain that would give you an immune response without actually triggering yellow fever. And that would be the first yellow fever vaccine. And he came up with that in 1937. He won the Nobel Prize. He was the only person ever to win the Nobel Prize for medicine for pioneering a vaccine. They didn't even hear what the Jonas saw because they thought most of what he did wasn't original. But they came up to this guy, Max Spieler, a South African doctor. He got the Nobel Prize. The only person to get the Nobel Prize for a vaccine until 2023 when uh, a Brandeis graduate got the vaccine for uh, the Nobel Prize for the vaccine that, that helps fight the COVID virus. Uh, at any rate, uh, it works. The vaccine works. So uh, all we're going to do is give people the vaccine. You're not, you're not going to get yellow fever. It's one of the best, most effective vaccines ever pioneered uh, in our medical history. It was so good, and it would always be so good, that in 1941, the U.S. military decided it would be a good idea to give everybody the yellow fever vaccine who was going in a uniform. And uh, that's what the military did, even though it's South America, Central America, where you uh, get yellow fever, also equatorial Africa. You don't get it in Asia. There's no yellow fever in Guadalcanal, the Psalms. No, there's no yellow fever, there's malaria. No yellow fever. But they gave people the vaccine anyway, and the result was that many of those batches of vaccines were infected by hepatitis B, and that gave us the biggest vaccine-related epidemic in U.S. history during World War II. Uh, something like 50,000 hepatitis cases struck U.S. soldiers. And if you can show that you are related to a U.S. soldier who got hepatitis and who suffered real damages from it, you can get military benefits as somebody related to somebody with a war-related injury because of that. But the story of the vaccine besides that episode has been very positive. If you go to a place with yellow fever, like Equatorial Africa, they usually ask you to have the yellow fever vaccine. If you go to Peru, for example, they'll ask you to get the yellow fever vaccine. And if you do it, you're fine. Probably nothing to worry about. But people still die of yellow fever. Not everybody in Africa has had the vaccine. Not everybody in uh, the tropics of the New World has had the vaccine. So tens of thousands of people a year die of yellow fever because there's still no cure. Uh, you just hope for the best if you get to the toxic stage. Uh, when the coagulated blood starts being coughed up, you hope for the best. But your chances are still less than 50-50 after that. Uh, so tens of thousands of people still die, which means if you want to get rid of it, you just got to get rid completely of either the ship die. Get rid of that mosquito, you get rid of the yellow fever. Uh, for humans only, so still among less, what, what we call lesser primates. Uh, uh, so it's still there, but it wouldn't be among humans if they got rid of Edis and ship die. And uh, the way to get rid of Edis and ship die, we think, is to do what this company, some of you may have read about this, Oxitec is doing. So Oxitec's idea is to flood the environment, wherever there's yellow fever, flood the environment with a special genetically modified strain of mosquito. And that mosquito, that male mosquito, when they impregnate female mosquitoes, will give birth only to female mosquitoes who die right away or male mosquitoes who live. And if it's only male mosquitoes, they don't affect anybody. It's female mosquitoes who affect you, not male mosquitoes. And if it's only male mosquitoes, no more Aedes aegypti after a few generations, and that will get rid of everything. No more yellow fever. And they've already begun doing that in parts of the United States, uh, spreading these genetically modified mosquitoes around. So that's like a good idea. Uh, now, we could have some kind of a horrible Jurassic Park mosquito. But, uh, that uh, but that's another problem. Uh, we, we have... Uh, Heavy weaponry, maybe to deal with them. Although, when it comes to genetically modified mosquitoes, uh, maybe this is the way to go. Uh, and we'll meet in a few years and we'll assess that. <laughs> so, next week is something way more terrifying than yellow fever, and not cholera. As bad as yellow fever goes, uh, nothing provoked a more terrified reaction on people than cholera. Uh, so, we'll get to that next week. <laughs> All right. Now, are there any uh, questions or comments before I let you go? Just go ahead. Can you tell me what the difference was between the water that would allow for malaria as oh, opposed no. to? It must have different characteristics, right? Because why wouldn't the 
I'm going to say the mosquito's name incorrectly, the one for yellow fever. Why wouldn't it flourish in the same water, the brackish water that the um, that the mosquitoes did for yellow before for malaria? Oh, it, it, it could live in marsh and swamplands. Okay. It, it could live there, but uh, there's some mechanism about spreading its eggs and laying eggs that really requires still, really still water. Okay. And that's why it like cisterns because the hardly any ripple there. Uh, so the, the only thing I know about it is that they have to do with the, the ease of laying eggs. But uh, naturally, it could still live in, in swamplands. And, and during times of the year where maybe there hasn't been rain for a while, uh, after the larvae have some time to hatch, they do OK. But uh, they, they really do like very, very still water. That's, that's really all I know about it. Can I ask you one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. What percentage of Napoleon's army um, perished uh, in, in Haiti? In Haiti, 80%. 80% oh, uh, died in battle or yellow people, mostly yellow people. It's melt, melted away. So I, I imagine you're sent on that expedition in all you've known is Poland or, or France. <laughs> that's where you're growing up, that's where your friends are, that's where your family are. And, and, and you die after a few weeks in this place you've barely heard of. It's a, and that's one of the, the, the constant refrains of the, of the terrors of war, is that phenomenon. They end up dying in these places that weren't even put on a map for you. Just never knew they were there. Uh, and that was the fate of all too many Frenchmen. Uh, and along the way, they committed horrible atrocities in Haiti. Uh, some of you know the story about attack dogs being especially born from Jamaica to be sick on, on the Haitians, not just to kill them, but to, but to terrify them. Um, there were atrocities on, on both sides. So there was no love lost uh, in that conflict. So it was brutal of all wars uh, in, in the colonial era. And that's saying something. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hey. Um, being acclimated seems like a superpower at the, at the yeah. time. And was there any discussion of like a task force with people who were acclimated going into, let's say, Memphis, where, when there's an outbreak, or any other place that has an outbreak? Was there any talk about using those people to to help people who are suffering? Not that I know of. Um, the one reason for that is the acclimation phenomenon was pretty unique in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where you saw it way more than anywhere else. And the attitude in New Orleans was that we like it the way it is. They had very little interest in trying to explore the cause of yellow fever or helping anybody else out. They aligned it the way they were. They dealt with things the way they were. That was a very insular community for such a great trading town. It's amazing how insular they really were. So I'm, I'm not aware of any effort at all to use that superpower to maybe put together a core of volunteers who could go to wherever they were needed during a yellow fever epidemic. Uh, they wanted the power and wanted the resources there in New Orleans, and they cared very little about what was going on anywhere else. Yeah, go ahead. I'm interested in a little bit more information on, on Mr. Covington. Yes. And you mentioned they created a membrane where a mesh, a mesh was so fine mesh that bacteria, which is larger, couldn't get through it, but the virus could. Yes. So how did the how did they get the virus through this very fine mesh? What did they use? Well, I, I don't know quite what the mechanism was. I have this picture. I, I know that there's a, a term of art for it, uh, about wherever you, you put blood into measure what's in the blood and to identify anything you'd be interested in it. Uh, and then you pass it on through another membrane. But I, I don't really know how they got things so finely tuned the, the way they did. Of course, they knew about bacteria by then. They could see it through the microscope. They knew how big they were. What year was this? This was about 1900. Wow. Yeah. So, so I, I, the only thing I can think of is that they wanted something that would keep out bacteria, but if there's anything small, it could get through. And that would mean a virus, right? And I, I'm not sure how familiar they were with what viruses looked like back then, but really they had to be smaller than bacteria. The virus was just a theory. Yeah. So, so yeah. You know, they, they, they didn't identify the virus until like 30 years later. Uh, about the time that they were working on the vaccine is when they identified the virus. I think they identified the virus in the 20s. But uh, I guess all they knew was the virus was smaller if it existed. So the Scottington experiment, what it did was it really ruled out a bacteria. Yeah. So it's not like the plague, it's something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. 1900. That's I, impressive. I, I, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could explain just what they were doing. Back then, but but they but see all these guys on the Yellow Fever Commission, uh, two of them were specialists in tropical diseases. 
And they knew about as much of them as, as anybody could. So if anybody's going to make a contraption like that, I guess it would be them. But I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what they did. Yes, go ahead. Um, is yellow fever a problem now in dairy and gap? And, no. and so it's not. So that's why we're not seeing it. No. I wasn't sure if, if it were, if we we're not seeing it at the border because people didn't survive that long or? Oh, the, oh you mean uh, the dairy and gap? based upon the migration into the, the southern United States. Right, I mean, it's basically 60 uninhabited miles. Yeah, there, there are, are reports of growing worries about yellow fever. I don't think there's, there's anything there that would mean there's any immediate concern, but people do come from Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and they go through the Darien Gap. But if there's an area of concern, it wouldn't be the Darien Gap, it would be ours to the south, but it's still yellow fever. Um, but I, usually, I think worries about disease of, of that sort of tend to be overstated for political purposes. But you, you do see some stories in the press about people raising that concern. And that there's a growing concern about global warming, which will be good for mosquitoes, if not good for much else. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why there's a big push towards genetically modified mosquitoes. But, if, but in Panama itself, yellow fever is not a concern. No, I mean, I was wondering particularly about the gap. No, no, okay. no, not, not in and of itself, no. Yes, go ahead. So they're, they've already started an experiment with these specially designed yeah. mosquitoes for a gene drive that will produce only sterile male mosquitoes? Yeah, I think they started the, the Florida Keys. The they got permission for that? They got permission. It was heavily blocked by environment, environmentalists, so we, we don't actually know what these mosquitoes can do. Maybe we should think twice about this, but it was permitted in 2020 by I guess EPA and FDA, they, they allowed it. And the initial experiments have worked very well. So they want to continue it in Brazil and in other parts of the United States and Central America. Because Dr. Sam Telford wants to do the same thing with Lyme disease. Ah, uh, yes. On, uh, on one of the small islands off Nantucket, which is isolated. He wants to create a species of mouse that will not transmit Lyme disease. Really? And yeah. uh, he's been working for at least three or four years now mm -hmm. to get the people of Nantucket to agree with it. And most of them are agreeable to it because they're plagued by it. Sure. Because there's four to 5,000 deer over there. And, uh, but he hasn't gotten all the permission yet. So every year he has, he comes over and he does another hearing. The people are all in favor and it dies again. Oh. It never goes anywhere. Yeah, so well, I'm surprised that these other guys got permission. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the company called uh, called uh, Oxitec. They're doing it. I think they're not think anybody else is, but they are. But nobody brought up the problem with the, if these mosquitoes, if the population of mosquitoes die off, mm -hmm. if there's less mosquitoes, mm -hmm. that's less food supply for birds. Well, but remember, it's only one species of one genus of mosquito that supposedly this is aimed at. Is a chip guy. There'll still be plenty of other kinds of mosquitoes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's probably a reason there's less concern about it than maybe we would think. And hopefully there's no crossbreeding from Aegis of Chip Die over to somebody else's mosquito. Yes. Well, let's hope so. Okay. Uh, yes. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Can I ask one more question? You, you can ask one more question. Um, I'm very interested in this racist idea that black people could not contract yellow fever, mm -hmm. but inevitably, obviously, black people did contract yeah. yellow fever. So how, how did those racist people confront that? Yeah, there were two opposite problems. Uh, one, that they don't contract yellow fever. The other, well, if they've been acclimated, which presupposes that they can get yellow fever, <laughs> then uh, they're worth more money. And it's part of a, a grander story, of course, that we're all familiar with about how if you want to justify an unjustifiable institution, what you do is you get in the habit of lying to yourself, uh, which is what they did. Uh, they, they lied to themselves up until 1865, and in a way, they're still lying to themselves. They're mm -hmm. descendants. But uh, that, that's, the, that's what happened. Well, we'll see you all next week. Yes, all right. Thank you all.